All right, good afternoon, everyone on Zoom, everyone here. We're gonna have a little bit of like strange uh, hybrid first lecture here going on. Um, my name is Maria Nicanor and I'm the Executive Director of Rice Design Alliance. Um, and off behalf of uh, Dean Marjanovic at the School of Architecture and the board and the team of RDA, I want to welcome everyone in Zoom and everyone here on Parish Gallery to our lunchtime lecture for the 2021 Houston Design Research Grant recipients, Liz Galvez and Estefania Barajas. This is also our first almost sort of in-person lecture at the school in almost two years. So I'm happy to connect with all of you via Zoom today from Farish Gallery here at the School of Architecture, where we have a small audience attending today's lecture as well, um, which is a real um, sight for sore eyes. And hopefully we'll be able to do that um, uh, more moving forward in the coming months. So there's a, a big thank you is due to the entire team at Rice Architecture and RDA who are making today's event possible behind the scenes, including Noel Hines and Raquel Pucho and our own students, Dana Kim and Elena Chen. We are also really grateful today to Victoria Elizondo because on the lecture about food equity and accessibility, she has provided incredible homemade tamales for lunch here today for those of us here. So thank you very much, y gracias, Victoria. And um, our lecture today takes place within the larger framework of the Architecture School Fall Lecture Series titled Building Identities, which which intends to highlight the idea that the construction of physical structures is inseparable from the construction of human identities. So through today's two RDA lectures, we tackle a crucial element in the creation of our identity, which is food culture, um, as seen through the larger lens of design and urban planning. A little bit of background on today's lectures and on this RDA grant, which all of you are always welcome to apply to next year. Um, the Houston Design Research Grant is RDA's main annual research grant. We've been awarding this grant for over 20 years now with the goal of supporting research that can make a significant contribution to Houston's communities through design thinking. This year, applicants were asked to focus on the theme of food equity and food deserts in an urban context as a critical area of work to keep exploring and developing further. Today's lunchtime lecture celebrates the faculty winner of the grant, our own Liz uh, Galvez, as well as, as the student, student winner also our own uh, Estefania Barajas. And as part of their grants, uh, both of them received $6,000 towards their research. Um, they will present here today in today's lunchtime lecture, and they will be published um, uh, with their projects in the next issue of Site Magazine coming out next year. Both Liz and Estefania will be presenting their projects with an opportunity to address questions at the end of their presentations through um, a Q&A, which we will do first via Zoom, then we'll say goodbye to all of you, and then we'll do a Q&A here in person um, to avoid complications matters further um, with a hybrid format. Uh, so we'll enjoy a little bit of lunch and tamales here and we will disconnect from the Zoom session and say goodbye to friends online. So before we begin, uh, I also want to thank very enthusiastically our friends at Mitsui USA, uh, the Mitsui Foundation. Um, they are the philanthropic arm of Mitsui USA, who for the second year now in a row is uh, generously funding this critical research grants through uh, a very generous gift to RDA. Um, so we thank uh, very much Akira Asakaya, Eric Mustafik, Eric Campbell, Sandra Kenny, and Nami Smith, all from Mitsui, um, for their generosity and for making it so, so easy to work with all of you throughout the year. Um, I would also like to thank all the members of the jury who helped select Liz and Estefania this year. Um, we had a six member jury that included architects and farming experts, designers, urban planners and engineers. Uh, a special thank you is due uh, to Margaret Wallace Brown. She is the director of the city of Houston's planning and development department. Um, I thank Margaret first because she was instrumental in our connection to our friends at Mitsui. And second, because as the public programs and outreach of an organization that we are, our work is only really relevant when we include others from outside the academic community in it. Um, so having many partners as well as the city and the urban planning department participate so actively and directly in urban research is truly important to us. So thank you again for being so close to the school and to RDA over the years, Margaret. Um, in addition to that, the rest of the jury members that helped select the winning proposals were Juan Jose Castellon, assistant professor here at Vice Architecture. Um, Tommy Garcia Prats, who's the founder and general manager of Small Places and Finca Tres Robles, 
Justin Smith, Senior Associate at Walter P. Moore, and Nicola Springer, who's the Executive Vice President and Director of K-12 Projects at Kirksey Architecture. Um, ultimately, the two winning proposals were selected because they address social and educational approaches to the question of food equity, and that's what made the two of them stand out um, and what got the jury really excited about um, all of them. And now, just to quickly finish, at the end, we'll have a Q&A um, with, uh, with Liz and with Estefania to lead the Q&A session. We will be joined by Monique Alejos. Uh, hi, Monique. I see you there somewhere, so I know you're there. Um, and Monique is a Rises and Alliance young professional who is a project coordinator at Apollo BBC. It's a, a Houston-based multidisciplinary engineering cons consulting firm. Um, Monique has been uh, a young professional uh, member since 2014. It's a great group of young professionals in Houston uh, that works with us at RDA, um, has contributed to many programs uh, over the years, and she has an interest in food sourcing, urban agriculture, and sustainability in underserved communities in Houston. So she was the perfect person to um, coordinate our Q&A um, later. So thank you, Monique, and we'll talk to you later. And um, for those of you in Zoom, you'll know what to do uh, later to submit your, your questions. So with that, um, we're going to start and I want to introduce Liz, who many of you here know. Uh, Liz Galvez is a Mexican-American registered architect. She directs Office, Office EG and teaches as a visiting critic here at Rice Architecture. She received an, an MA from um, MIT with a concentration in history, theory, and criticism of architecture, and a bachelor's degree in architectural and philosophical studies from Arizona State University. And her work focuses on the interface between architecture, theory, and environmentalism through an examination of building technologies. Previously, um, Liz taught at the University of Michigan Stoutman College. She has practiced um, at architecture firms in the United States, as well as in Mexico, including Will Bruder Architects, Nada, and Rochkin Arquitectos. Her writing has been published in Footprint, uh, Pigeon, Platt, Pool, and Soon in Site Magazine. And in 2016, she received the C. Becker Prize for the Fine Arts. And in 2021, she was awarded the Architecture League Prize as well. So today, Liz has presented her project, The Transgressive Kitchen. And with that, I'll pass it on to Liz. Hello, thanks for joining us today, um, both locally and from afar. Can everybody in the room hear me? Okay, awesome. Um, so thank you um, to Maria Nicanor for all of your support, to the RDA for making this grant and event possible, and congratulations to Estefania Barajas, uh, who has won the award in the student category. I will be sharing my grant proposal, The Transgressive Kitchen from Masa to Maps in Houston. The research project will analyze how the domestic kitchen in relation to migrant populations and informal food supply chains in Houston addresses social, economic, and biological issues and in, as an entangled space of speculation. But before, I would like to start with a brief introduction to previous work that I have done in the space of cooking, recipes, and kitchens. My work broadly examines the interface between architecture, theory, and environmentalism uh, through an examination of the technologies of building in relationship to climate change, uh, including material practice, enclosure systems, and environmental management. It has often brought me to examine the spaces of domesticity to think about how they condition not only the built environment, but our expectations of it. If the prevailing forms of environmental thinking continue to focus on quote unquote sustainable ways of life, these interests in material practice and environmental management place the kitchen as a key moment of interest. Furthering speculation on how these spaces of technicity, gendered politics, and the production of nourishments for ourselves and others, the C-shaped kitchen, for example, deploys a ventilation system which is organized to eject cooked air into a centralized area while allowing for collective cooking along the exterior of the form. Reformulations of the kitchen then have the ability to rethink both collective assemblies of cooks and their cooked air being ejected into the atmosphere. The home, especially the kitchen, represents the site of traditionally gendered labor dedicated to the sustenance of life, cooking, eating, drinking. 
Yet, if understood as fulfilling the basic necessities for life, the home allows for the presumed development of a separate public sphere where politics and public actions take place. In developing an immaterial brick, we, the architects, followed recipes to cook our own bricks, thereby making our own building materials. Learn, leaning into gendered understandings of sustenance, housework, and cooking, we carefully and deliberately measured ingredients, adding and mixing, ladling and pouring, baking and demolding. The processes mobilized point to the possibility of productively embedding the politics of building with the processes of domestic labor, and in doing so through careful, deliberate, and discrete acts that address global problems. Furthermore, the, the recipe was dispersed through an immaterial cookbook and a cooking show, enabling the home cook or the curious architecture student to produce their own materials as well. As a child, I had become acquainted with the concept of an informal home cook, or la señora de los tamales, who cooked tamales at home, often with the help of family members, and then sold her goods in the urban setting, at construction sites, at car washes, or in the Walmart parking lot. On a human July midday in Houston, I recognized the woman, la señora de los tamales, from the anonymity of the car wash queue. I observed her movements from my rear view mirror. A couple parked their Texas sized pickup truck. With quick gestures, the man untangled a rope and slid an ice chest towards the edge of the truck bed. The woman stealthily maneuvered through the workstations of the car wash, collecting money and memorizing orders. La Senora represents a typology of informal food worker a homemaker, often a woman that cooks out of her domestic kitchen, selling and delivering prepared food to precise sites in the city where they can be purchased, often by immigrant or working class peoples. As I sat in my car, I wondered where and how the tasty tamales were made. While informal food vending is well studied and documented in typologically gridded urban settings, for example, those of Mexico City, this grant allows me to study how communities adopt models of informal food systems in response to the suburban housing stock and car dependency of Houston's fine urbanism. While progressive socialist constructivist era models such as Moscow's Narcomfin communal house imagined the kitchen as a space where collective meals could be organized, the efficient standardized kitchen of the typological single family house assumes a private kitchen. The kitchen's publicity, albeit a social space for cooking, eating and entertaining is limited to those inhabiting the house and their guests. The archetype of the American single family home as a gendered domain, foregrounding family and bodily sustenance, entrenched gendered relationships of homemaking as a primarily female task. The theorized domesticity of the home kitchen holds it captive within the private sphere. As such, the domestic kitchen has been conceptualized as not urban, not public, and non-contributing to the economic cycles of the home. Such collective and commercial tactics point to the incongruities between immigrant living practices and Houston single family housing typologies, most typically providing a three bedroom, two bathroom, one kitchen home designed toward family scaled kitchen operations. Yet women and even men are using their knowledge of home cooking towards economic enablement within the city's informal food supply chains, especially in immigrant working class communities, thereby transgressing narrow, unnuanced descriptions of the home within urban space. Cooking is an act of creation. As such, the act of cooking and the domestic space of the kitchen entangles one to the world through the acquisition of uh, cooking materials, ingredients, and reliance on energy and fuel systems to process these materials. 
As a processing center, the kitchen necessitates spe uh, specialized equipment, fuel, and water in conjunction with precise environmental controls. Cooking equipment and infrastructures incur substantial costs within home construction and require precise knowledge towards their use. Historically, for Mexican women, kitchen management often represented their most extensive training and education. Annotations and references to advanced techniques further cement the practice as a notable form of research amongst Latina female identity. Here, we are seeing a video of a well-known cooking show which takes place through uploads on YouTube. The Mi Rancho a Su Cocina and Doña Angela Romero have over three and a half million subscribers. And she, had recently, she has recently been named one of Mexico's most influential women by Forbes magazine. Contemporaneously, the matriarchal figure in small towns such as this one in Michoacán, where I also happen to be from, uh, continues to be venerated from the accumulation of her cooking knowledge, research, and practical experience. For many Mexican women, especially in smaller towns and in previous generations, cooking, domestic labor, and homemaking is an education. Knowledge of technology and scientific processes of cooking and related thermodynamics incur a constant sharing of books, annotations, and improved techniques often adapting and changing over time and in response to technological developments in the home equipment. What happens when immigrant women bring this knowledge of cooking to the United States? And how does this knowledge intersect with our architecture and the city? This form of research and collective knowledge is passed on between women, between their older and younger generations, but also between neighbors and friends, and at times shared, compared, and exchanged between different, different households. In this particular case, my own grandmother directs our Christmas tamale making. Informal cooked food supply chains further introduce strategic collective alliances within the Latinx communities in Houston. The transgressive kitchen, commercial and domestic, instrumentalized and familial, changes the, the discrete theorization of the domestic kitchen as exclusively private. The project acts as a source of qualitative information gathering and documentation by locating and interviewing infor three informal cooked food merchants in the Houston area. The film follows each cook for a day's work and expands the cooking video as an aesthetic and exploratory research methodology. Furthermore, we explore how the single family housing type can learn from the systems of collectivity that are already taking place to suggest adaptations that respond to the important roles that kitchens and informal food supply systems are developing in Houston. The film suggests a visual map which traces the cook's movement between their domestic kitchens, their recipes, and the city, exemplifying opportune moments of higher density and transgressive acts between the individual and collectivity. The project learns from their lives from the project learns from the lifestyles of these cooks, their families, and those who consume their food to suggest projective models and adaptations that work to further the imagination of the single family housing stock in Houston. The Señora's Kitchen transcends the private heteronormativity of the single family detached home. The social reality of immigrant laborers in Houston raises the need for collective and experimental ways of living that challenge, if not at times even contradict, the established forms of nuclear family dwelling. In the spirit of radical samples, such as Francis Gabe's self-cleaning home, the research will speculate on adaptations to the design of transgressive kitchens within the Houston context, 
to instigate possibilities towards furthering the imagination of the single family home. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Uh, and we'll have an opportunity to ask questions at the very end. So a reminder for all of you that we'll do that later. So now I'd like to introduce our second speaker and student, student winner, Stefania Barajas. Stefania is a graduate student at Rice Architecture and holds a Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Texas at San Antonio. Her project um, that she's going to be telling us about today, uh, titled Tables in Des Deserts and Swamps, How Food Education Can Help Solve the Root of Food Insecurity, aims to promote urban agriculture and create new public spaces that could provide food education, fresh produce, and entrepreneurial opportunities for underserved communities. We were very interested in Estefania's project um, because it introduces an alternative collective space within schools in Houston, which was a new element, uh, proposing a new system of care that integrates food and water infrastructure alongside already existing educational systems and, and channels here in the city. So with that, welcome Estefania. Thank you, Maria, for the introduction. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the Rise Design Alliance for this opportunity to my faculty advisor, Juan Jose Castellon, and of course, to my family, peers, and all the faculty who have been um, continuously participating in this conversation. We often begin talking about work and research, but forget to mention the narratives and experiences that made us curious about a specific subject. My research has been informed in many ways by my family's history and experience growing up in Mexico, and then moving to a water town that it's known for its limitations and disparities. Today, I will be talking about food, food as a fundamental, most basic need, as an environmental concern and food within education. Similar to architecture, everything having to do with food, it's gathering, cultivation, preparation and consumption, stages a cultural act. If we go to the beginning, the beginning of architecture, we often recall this famous image by the essay of architecture, which describes the essence of architecture as immense need to shelter himself from nature. Many would argue that architecture began long before and that the sheer planning and preparation of the land is an act of design planning um, of architecture itself. Farming originated as humans began to mold nature to their needs, emerged independently and spread across the world. Grains and farming remained as an integral focus as populations developed due to the stability of food, urban area surface shaping the built environment and giving birth to the development in cities. Cities which often consisted of dense areas with a central food distribution system surrounded by farmland. This all changed in the 19th century um, with the invention of the railway pasteurization and refrigeration. Our new distribution, production, and consumption capacity no longer require proximity and enable the disconnection of food, far apart from sight and mind, far away from the city. Today, there are too many problems related to industrial agriculture, alteration of growing seasons, inefficient use of land, carbon emissions, if we take our current practice, which includes transit, warehouses, and grocery stores, almost 40% of food becomes waste. That's 1.6 billion tons of waste, or $1.2 trillion a year. Most crucially, agriculture irrigation accounts for 70% uh, fresh water use worldwide. It is also the largest using sector and major pollutant of water. In recent years, many droughts in the United States have affected agricultural production while diminishing surface and groundwater reserves. These modes of production have detrimental effects, not just to the environment, but our physical health. More awareness has been given to these issues at a consumer level, provided as a choice, um, a choice that doesn't include everyone and is dependent on income and physical accessibility. For a minute, picture this schedule as your own. You have two jobs, um, you go in at 7 a.m. and you get out at 10 p.m., almost no break in between. After a long day of work, you come home, hungry and exhausted, and now that you're home, what's for dinner? How much energy and time do you have? But most importantly, what are your options? What's open? This is a day of a single parent making a minimum wage. 
This is an oversimplified illustration that tries to portray some of the correlations between obesity rates and hunger in underserved communities. Inherently, those below the poverty line are obligated to consume a nutrient-poor diet, contributing to obesity, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, and other chronic diseases. The phrase food storm is often used to describe this type of urban environment where an abundance of fast food, convenience stores, and liquor stores outnumber healthy food options. Recently, however, some have argued that the term phrases, concepts like food storm and food desert should, not be, um, should be replaced with food apartheid. Food activist Karen Washington introduced the term food apartheid to call attention and to emphasize the intersection of food and issues like poverty, racism, a lack of health care and joblessness. In the United States, nearly one in four households experienced food insecurity in 2020. Even without the pandemic nationally, the USA Economic Research Service estimates that 13.7 million households experienced food insecurity at some point during 2019. While Houston far exceeds the national average on issues related to food insecurity and obesity, an astonishing 20% of Houstonians live under food apartheid. Overall, 19% of Houstonians and 25% of Houston's children do not know where they will find their next meal. Often, this is a disadvantage shared by zip code. Sola Lowell in the article, Serving Americans Food Dusters, describes this relationship well. In the third word, it's a lot easier to pick a fast food than fresh grains or a salad. The nearest supermarket is about two miles away, which means you need to cross 16 lanes or a highway or walk half a mile to the nearest bus stop if you don't have a car. Um, so clearly the solution is not to give everyone a car. Um, scholars and advocates uh, of food justice understand the source to be systemic, a lack of sources, physical and monetary access, time and dietary habits. Programs such as food pantries and food banks are essential but band-aid solutions to the underlying causes of food insecurity. Sustainable solutions require the reinvestment in education, public space, green infrastructure, economic development, and family support. This summer, in conjunction with this grant, I had the opportunity to see uh, 15 different programs and initiatives raising awareness and acting on these issues. Some of the programs include Arcosanti in Arizona, Orm School in Arizona, uh, South Valley Economic Development Center in New Mexico, Alma Backyard Farms in California, <clears throat> I missed one, and um, College Area Garden in San Diego. Uh, these urban farms and community initiatives varied in scale, uh, location, climate, and funding, but almost so focused on education and the distribution of fresh produce, prioritizing awareness and teaching about the impact of food access within their own communities. Some hosted seminars and experimental workshops to demonstrate various growing techniques. Others focused on environmental awareness, recycling, compost, polyculture. Other organizations such as Alma Vaquer Gardens um, included job training programs. Uh, for them, it was about helping on restoring the lives of formerly incarcerated women and men through hands-on technical education in urban agriculture, carpentry, and landscaping. Um, in other programs, regardless of the produce or the planter size, children were able to learn about preparing healthy meals, gardening, and waste reduction. While visiting these programs, I was very humbled to see the passion and love for this work, um, but also to hear people's stories. One story that stood out was a man who described the impact a farming had in his life as a child with a mental disorder. He was able to not only find a unique mode of learning, but find a passion in horticulture and food. And he's now spearheading a movement of sustainable and regenerative agriculture in Arizona. More than anything, I learned that you can do so much with some shade, a few tables and storage. When speaking and asking about the limitations within their space and tools, in addition to pests, climatic changes and water insecurity were huge factors for them. And they reminded me of home and the events we saw a few months ago in um, our 2021 Texas power crisis. Um, as a matter of fact, some of our owned urban farms were devastated. Houston, Texas is the fourth largest city in the US, a precarious city known for its diversity, food and vibrant culture, but also known for its complicated relationship with water, infrastructure and class and race divisions. According to the 2020 study by the Kinder Institute, Houston was ranked 85th in green spaces, 
in addition to this misdistribution of grain infrastructure, Houston is also the city with the most fast food restaurants in the US. As we can see, those are the amount of parks and that's the population underneath. Uh, we have a lot of acres, but they're not evenly distributed. <clears throat> So what does a space for urban food education look like in 2021? How can we make systems of food more resilient? But more importantly, how can these programs become more accessible? How do we distribute evenly across our city? Throughout climatic emergencies and crises, schools have been primary sources of safety. During the pandemic, school meals became essential not just to ease hunger for children, but millions of families. Even before COVID-19 in 2019, nearly 30 million children participated in the National School Lunch Program. When reminded of schools as public spaces, it is natural to turn to Hannah Rand, who has reminded us of the loss of public space. But aside from the philosophical and political implications, a more practical observation is that many communities, such as my own, use their nearest school as a park or a playground. Schools are not just spaces for learning and socialization, but often act as a safe space for emotional and economic instability at home. More importantly, although the quality and quantity of the resources are depending on location, schools are consistently distributed across cities. Um, and this is, this is where designed and this is where architecture begins. This, is, uh, this research is part of my thesis, which is at its very early stages. I can't stress that enough. <laughs> I will be fully developed in a few months. Um, I think everyone's invited. Tables in Deserts and Swamps is an invitation to embrace and include urban farming in education. My thesis proposes that agriculture must synthesize with architecture to produce a new culture based on community, resiliency, and care. To amend the uneven distribution of green spaces, because my project is located in Houston, I am focusing on HIS, HISD. It's the largest school district in Texas and already prioritizing food pedagogy within um, their class and through outreach programs. So out of the 283 schools, I decided to focus on the 153 elementary schools based on the quantity and physical accessibility they present, but also because working with a younger age group would allow to engage with families. This intervention is not intended to add work or responsibility to the school. This pro the program would operate as a separate entity implement, implemented, administered, and funded by the city or nonprofit philanthropic organization. It is not meant to depend on voluntary efforts. Quite the opposite is intended as a space that can foster a new form of labor. The programmatic elements of this new typology include a food hub, distribution center, food pantry, in outdoor classrooms for after school programs and community events. The following are very conceptual stages in my project, uh, but the idea is to have a space within a space, a structure that can be more permanent, more resilient, and another that invites change uh, more ephemeral. The structure, of course, pays homage to the greenhouse in terms of prefabrication, modularity, and repetition. When thinking of this as a system, but also as an environment for children to play, I imagine it to act almost like a puzzle or a game. So these are the puzzle pieces, um, the programmatic pieces that represent the different skills and elements, such as farming, storage, sitting, cooking, eating, playing. And the program is flexible and um, able to grow and adapt to different site conditions. In addition to integrating new technologies, in food pedagogy. My proposal aims to facilitate and destigmatize food insecurity by making it effortless to receive produce. It aims to provide a missing threshold between the inside and outside, the public and domestic life. Overall, the scope introduces a multi-scale systems of food and water consciousness, a new public space that supports the social, emotional and cognitive development for children and their families, a space that can spark passion and help cultivate systems of care, um, space for reflection away from the city noise and overstimulation, but most importantly, a space for the senses, that of engagement, autonomy, co-production, collection, and community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefania. Um, and now we're going to do a Q&A on Zoom. And if people here in the room 
don't mind staying along. We'll do a few minutes on Zoom and then <clears throat> we'll pass it over to the room. So Monique, I know you're, you're there. So I'm going to let you um, take some questions from the Q&A and if we can hear them, I'd be happy to repeat them here for, for the, the people here in Farish. Alrighty, can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so again, if you guys on Zoom have any questions, um, please feel free to type them. Um, I believe there is a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you type in some questions, I can go ahead and uh, facilitate the Q&A session. Um, to start off with, let's see here. Um, let's see, I guess first question uh, is for Liz. Um, let's see, it says, uh, you describe these kitchens as transgressive, which transgressive is defined as involving a violation of accepted or imposed boundaries of social acceptability. However, these, practice, these practices are common or even normal to immigrant communities. How do you think these practices have changed with the use of technology? Uh, for example, social media, pay apps, um, et cetera. And how do you anticipate these practices becoming more widely known or accepted? Hi, thank you um, for um, your question. So I would start off by saying that, um, as you point out, yes, there is a kind of um, acceptance of these, uh, of these transgressions already yet they're occurring within an already established model, right? So as society and the kind of values and the kind of um, community allegiances and alliances that occur, like my, my question is how, how that space of domesticity can uh, also evolve architecturally to take into account these changes, right? And so, um, I haven't necessarily looked into social media per se, but I think um, things like WhatsApp and uh, Instagram are actually exactly the kinds of ways in which these communities are communicating and selling or delivering their kinds of products. And so I think that there's definitely a link in how those may affect distribution in uh, a kind of sprawling city like Houston, but I still wonder what the kind of um, like physical relationships and negotiations uh, that play into that, how, how I, I still kind of suspect that there's an important factor of proximity and like physical space that mm -hmm. is really, really um, important or kind of primal to uh, to making those social media connections. And I've discovered this a little bit actually through, um, for example, our acquisition of the tamales today. <laughs> um, and so I actually uh, was super lucky to find um, uh, Victoria Elizondo through a kind of Instagram and like Facebook search. Um, and uh, nevertheless, I think that it has been a bit of a challenge, like finding uh, domestic hooks who are who are not actually um, having brick and mortar restaurants at the moment, right? And so I think that is where the kind of physical and like community relationships really will will play in, and where uh, the the kind of social media doesn't necessarily um, override that. Right. Yeah. Okay. A uh, second question uh, for Liz. Um, from a design aspect, uh, what changes do you anticipate occurring to make these kitchens more efficient um, to the cooks? Uh, also, on a bigger scale, uh, do you think these changes should be made on a community level? Um, for instance, um, you know, should be should community kitchens be built into multifamily projects or kind of you know lower income projects in specific communities? Do you think? Uh, how do you anticipate um, changes in the kitchen? Yes. Um, so first of all, I would be suspicious of the word efficient. 
I don't think that the most efficient model may be the, the most caring model or the most um, adaptable model or the one that really thinks about the values that are being exhibited in these kind of collective communities, right? And so I think that uh, part of how the, the model of a very typological kitchen takes place is through this kind of rhetoric of efficiency. So I would actually push back on efficiency as, as the kind of hallmark of how we define a good or a better kitchen. Um, and, and try to really address and embrace some of those other values. Um, secondly, in terms of, um, I, I love the idea that um, we're thinking typologically about the kitchen of a, as, a, as, a, as a kind of model, right? That is then uh, replicated through different uh, housing stocks. I think that of course the, the idea of that typology and that model should change at different scales and uh, at different scales of housing, whether that be collective housing or single family. But for me, I think it's really important to kind of focus on the, what, um, on, the on the kind of established um, prevalence of the single family house not only for how it replicates itself in physical space, but also how it replicates and continues to replicate itself as an aspirational um, goal for many of the um, many of us involved in, in these communities. And so the kind of crux of the project or um, a question that I examine in much of my work is how changing just one of the rooms of the of a typological kind of architectural example, how that can actually proliferate and um, create quite significant changes to to that through a kind. It's it's a little bit of a subversive um, act, but um, so so if we instantiate a series of new collective kitchen models for the single family house, like how does that change suburbia, for example? I see, thank you. Okay, I have one more question for you, Liz. Um, this is from Carla uh, via Zoom. Uh, she says, how do you think contemporary architecture, the design of open layout where the kitchens are in the same space as living room, dining area, dining area, et cetera, affect these practices in the Mexican kitchen where the use of spices and the food with strong smells are not longer maintained on it on a space, but they distribute through the house. Yeah, I think that's a really um, perfect example of how our, our architectural models are not necessarily adapting or responding to um, some very practical concerns in, in all of our homes and, and kitchens. I've actually had a really um, fantastic experience in while, while I was in practice where we were designing a home actually for um, an Asian cook. <laughs> and um, so, so, you know, this isn't just the, the Latinx community. This is um, really, um, a variety of different cultures that have uh, a variety of practices and ways in which they might utilize these spaces. And so um, to go back to the example of practice, the, the very first requirement was that the kitchen be separate from the rest of the house, right? And so I think that this is um, uh, really an important um, suggestion that is being made. And, and one of the one of the questions that I would love to address through design as I move forward. Thank you. Alrighty, thank you so much, Liz. Thank um, you. I think we have a few questions for Estefania. Okay, fantastic. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, let's see, we have one question for you uh, from Zoom, uh, from Marianne. Uh, she's, they say, um, Estefania, great presentation. With the mass urbanization trend we're seeing, particularly following a year of COVID lockdown, how do you think this migration of people out of city centers will impact your proposal to repurpose these existing spaces? Also, will enough of your target demographic move out of your target area to make an impact on your effort? So how is, is reframe, I'm trying to reframe the question, is it 
how am I um, thinking of suburbia and um, how am I, um, how would these spaces, outdoor spaces then be able to um, accommodate the, the people that are moving into suburbia? Yes, yeah, I guess with, um, you know, a year following COVID, I guess um, this makes the assumption that more people are moving out of the cities um, to suburbia. Um, so I'm working with existing schools and um, the project, the Vaposo, is it's meant to accommodate the existing size of the schools. And um, the, the structure would be something that you would be able to increase or would be able to grow depending on the amount of people. I'm, my assumption is that the more population you get, you would get another school. And then you would have another one of these programs and that would accommodate that population. I can't imagine I, I would be working with the population that already exists within that school. And so this is like a, this would be like a city question, right? Like how many people for school, uh, how much space for school and then how much of them can we host in this outdoor space? Um, that's my best, <laughs> that's my best answer. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I think that is uh, all of the questions so far. If you guys have any additional questions via Zoom, um, please submit them, um, but otherwise, um, Thank you so much, Estefania, for presenting this. Um, you know, I, I think your inclusion of all of these organizations um, in the Houston area that already are working on food equity um, and advocating for better food distributions um, in the Houston area, um, that I think that's doing a great job. And as an architect, you know, I feel like uh, designers are natural born uh, coordinators, just kind of fitting all of the pieces in and, and making a project work. So um, I, I think your uh, proposed project is, is already doing that. And, and I love your uh, communication and collaboration with um, existing uh, structures that are already in place in the city of Houston. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. So I think we're going to pass it on to questions over here in the, um, in the room, Monique. Okay. So with that, we're gonna thank you so much for moderating this. Um, and uh, thank you again to everyone who joined us over your lunch times via Zoom. And we're going to let you go and make you all very envious of our tamales here that we're gonna talk about while we talk a little bit more about these projects. Um, join us for the next uh, RDA lecture within the school's full lecture series uh, when we welcome Monument Lab. They are a public art and history studio based in Philadelphia, led by Paul Farber and Ken Lum. That lecture is on Zoom only on next Wednesday, October 27th at 12 p.m. So hopefully we um, hope to see you all there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Monique. Thank you, Noel, behind there. We'll see you all soon. Thank you. Bye.